I'm really glad to get to be here with you guys. Uh, when I got to meet Doug in person for the first time at WGBH in Boston, uh, it's about five weeks ago, around the beginning of December, um, it was really cool for me uh, to become familiar not just with Doug, but with the, uh, the Keen Network and what it is that you're all doing. I told Doug um, quite truthfully, and it's a little unlike me to make statements quite this strong, but um, what the Keen Network is trying to do is a mission that I feel personally more closely aligned with than just about any group I've gotten to speak with or in front of. Uh, so that's pretty special to me, and it's a real pleasure to get to be here, because you're my people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had a slightly unconventional career, if you could call it a career, I, I feel like I more get to play a lot of the time, uh, which is something I feel pretty fortunate for. I would rank my personal set of jobs pretty high on the, on the happiest jobs list, um, and I'll get to tell you a little more about it in a minute. This is a more exciting picture than I would usually put up for the first slide as well. It's me jumping off a building at MIT um, <laughs> doing a flip. It's not that I would necessarily encourage or hope for entrepreneurially landed engineers to be taking leaps uh, to such an extreme extent. However, it's an example of something that's been driving me for pretty much my whole life. It's the reason why uh, I love to pole vault. Um, why it kind of made sense when my friends and I watched our first videos when, uh, when parkour and free running and doing these sorts of things was first becoming popular on YouTube. We saw a couple of these videos and thought, we could learn that. So the thing that drove us to fall on our backs a whole lot of times is we unsuccessfully ran up the wall trying to get up the guts to step backward as we did our first wall flips. It's the same reason why, you know, we jump off a building and take a picture of it. It's the same reason why I do a lot of the engineering that I do. Because it'll be awesome. <laughs> no matter what happens, we'd always try to get something on film because either you're going to make it and it's going to be great, or you'll crash and you definitely want that on camera. <laughs> I connect really strongly uh, with what Doug was talking about this morning, particularly in the realm of um, the why and the personally fulfilling aspects of what an engineering career can be. Um, there were a number of influences on my life uh, that played into the mindset that I developed over time. And for me, the developing of my own uh, engineering mindset had a really tight integration between the fulfilling aspect and um, the technical aspects that, was, that were helping me accomplish what was fulfilling to me. And one of those people, you guys might be familiar with, um, it would be difficult to overstate this person's influence on my life, uh, particularly as a young person developing this mindset around loving to do things just for the sake of wanting to build it or wanting to try to do a flip over the couch um, off the trampoline and you know, hopefully not sprain my ankle. You could probably track this person's influence just by looking at some of the activities that I did as a kid. Fortunately, not all of them were successful. I tried to make bombs from fertilizer wrapped in newspaper in the backyard. Thank heavens those didn't work out. I tried to create a magnesium cutting torch by chopping apart my mom's bicycle frame. Thankfully, it was actually aluminum, and I had a difficult time igniting it. That would have been thermite had it worked if there was enough rust in there, too. Um, and it's, if you were there the time that I uh, lived through one of my finest moments, where in high school my jazz band was about to play this gig, and right at the last second, the guitar amp's fuse blew. Well, I got to save the day in a way that I had dreamed about by taking a gum wrapper with foil on the inside, wrapping the foil side toward the fuse, which of course shorted it out, totally negating the purpose of having a fuse, but nevertheless, plugged it back in, the guitar amp turned on, and I got to be MacGyver for the day. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, had a huge influence on me. And I didn't get to watch TV as a kid. My parents were quite intentional about um, facilitating my hands-on learning for both me and my sisters. I have a younger sister and an older sister. And uh, my mom is a piano teacher um, and an elementary school music teacher. My dad is uh, an IT systems admin, but he did his engineering training uh, with engineering physics at Oregon State. They were pretty careful about what they exposed us to. And to their credit, 
even though I didn't get to watch TV, I got my first hammer and nails at about age three and a half. And uh, when it was actually from my granddad, who also had a similar kind of influence on my dad's life. Um, when uh, the general approach to this, as I found out as time went on and as the projects got bigger and scarier and had more and more potential to cause damage to the house and to me, um, I really came to appreciate their approach, uh, which you know my dad certainly picked up from my granddad, in which they very intentionally cultivated. And uh, when um, Dolly Lemelson, when I won the Lemelson Prize, asked my granddad about why he was comfortable giving a three and a half year old his first hammer and nails, and they were roofing nails, so the, the head was a little bigger than usual. She said, well, won't, won't he hurt his fingers by hammering on them by accident? And granddad said, well, yeah, of course he will. But so did I, and I came out okay. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as parenting goes, I did not have helicopter parents, at least not in the, uh, in the sense of wanting to build things. Um, they really facilitated some exciting hands-on stuff, uh, almost to the detriment of our home. Now, back to MacGyver. He had a huge influence on my life and the mindset that I began to approach solving problems with. I think it's a really interesting testament to what I see as a, a very universal reverence of ingenuity that MacGyver's particular skill set is so prevalent. I mean, you can, you can talk to just about anybody and if you're in a tight spot, most of the time, if somebody makes a joke about having a paper clip and a rubber band and some chewing gum available, that the problem can be solved. And it's a, it's a reference to MacGyver, and it's, this, it's a really powerful example of how much power we recognize ingenuity holds. MacGyver is the, is the embodiment of the idea that through enough ingenuity, ordinary resources can become an extraordinary solution to any problem. That's the point of making a, a reference to having chewing gum and electrical tape and maybe a paper clip. They're totally unrelated to each other. And furthermore, they're totally unrelated to the problem at hand, which is what makes that joke funny. But the reason we bring it up is because we think, I believe, we recognize that there is some truth to that. That if we're able to be ingenious enough to look where we might not otherwise be looking, there's actually a solution waiting to be found. Now, my little sister also had a, a a bit of, she was too young to have an actual crush on MacGyver, but the power of that skill set being portrayed on screen in the way that it was certainly made anybody in our household want to be associated with MacGyver. My younger sister, rather than trying to practice the skill set MacGyver employed, um, instead took on his name for her play name. Her, her, her name's Joanna. Now, when she was playing, she was Christy MacGyver McLean the opera singing teacher of stuffed animals. So he made a big impression on all of us. <laughs> um, but I think the real beauty of seeing that action on screen, uh, and we see it many other places as well, is that when we watch MacGyver take seemingly random things and put them together into a solution, it's the same as any hero that we watch on screen in that the excitement we feel when that thing is successful and he saves the day, that's real excitement that we get to feel. And we're associating that with the skill set that MacGyver is employing to solve these problems. We get to feel that thrill of success, even though it wasn't us that was actually solving the problem. We get a tangible feeling of success and excitement and fulfillment and value from the tricks and amazing things he's performing on screen. Although some of the things are far-fetched, there is a persistent underlying uh, theme of this could be possible. That is a powerful seed to plant. Now, we see this same skill set being employed all over the place. Q is a great example. Now, this is the new Q, but uh, James Bond's gadgets are another wonderful example of uh, you know, a persistent, I would say worldwide, <coughs> trust in technology to get us out of a tight spot. He's always got some kind of gadget up his sleeve, James Bond does, responsible from Q. It's gonna help him get out of a tight spot when he most needs it. Same thing with Iron Man. Now here is an entirely technologically made superhero. Talk about technology getting out of a bind. There's real power in that. And if you count the, you know, the number of views and ratings on the Avengers and the Iron Man movies, this is a wonderful and you know, excitingly portrayed combination 
of those problem-solving technological skill sets that do amazing and inspiring things and get us out of a bind. Same thing with uh, our good friend Bruce Wayne on the right, AKA Batman. Now, of course, he's gotta have some kind of technical prowess because he's able to operate all these fancy gadgets, but the guy behind it for real is Lucius Fox in charge of, uh, what do they call it? Applied Sciences at Wayne Enterprises. I really enjoy Batman in particular, because in the same way that Iron Man is, he's just a guy. His power and his, his might and his saving the day ability comes from very well executed technological developments. How inspiring is that? That is very cool. So across the country and the world, we seem to universally revere these skill sets that allow us to solve major problems with technological ingenuity and problem solving prowess. So how is it that we're not swimming in engineers right now? Why do we have trouble, that, you know, at my company, we're certainly looking for engineers. Why don't we have applicants all over the world that are similarly inspired by these things that are just dying to beat down our door and come work for us and be productive in the world? I have a couple of thoughts on it. I want to offer some well, at least one answer based on my own personal experiences uh, certainly is growing up as a kid. So I have a question to pose before I launch into this problem-solving uh, problem story of mystery and excitement. Who here has used a fire extinguisher before? Oh, that's a great show of hands. How many people have used a fire extinguisher because they needed to put out a fire? <laughs> a couple fewer people, but still a pretty solid amount. That's great. Do you remember what it was like to get trained to use the fire extinguisher? Did you maybe read the directions, or were you a kid and you had an adult explain it to you? That was the case for me. Um, my dad taught me how to use a fire extinguisher, and uh, so I, I remember the process very clearly. We had a small dry chem fire extinguisher uh, stored in the kitchen, as well as you know, one in the garage, etc. Dad taught me how to pull the fire extinguisher out tip it upside down, bang on the bottom to kind of mix up the dry cam, and then of course you pull the pin out, squeeze, and then start blasting the fire. And if you follow the directions, you'll blast toward the bottom of the fire. There's an important missing piece, at least that I felt was missing from my education about the fire extinguisher use, and that was, how do you judge when you should actually use the fire extinguisher? This is more of a lesson in, in general planning in the first place. You know, just the concept that if you don't have a preconceived plan, when things go haywire, you're not going to know exactly what to do unless you've thought about it beforehand. Well, I knew how to use the fire extinguisher, but I didn't quite know when to use it. So when confronted with the decision of whether or not to use the fire extinguisher, despite the fact that in this case, which I'll tell you about, there were flames shooting up toward me, I was standing there looking at the fire extinguisher thinking, man, there's a plastic ring around that pin. I, it should be a really big deal if I pull this pin out, right? I, I don't know if this is the right time. It, it was definitely the right time. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 17 uh, in advanced chemistry class, I was encouraged to read the book October Sky uh, by my very awesome chemistry teacher. He was actually the fellow that also encouraged me to apply to MIT. Um, let's just say that I was involved in a small fire in the kitchen and, uh, well, by, by involved in, I should really say I was responsible for. <laughs> and by small fire, I mean I caught most of the kitchen on fire with rocket fuel. <laughs> it was a great time to use the fire extinguisher. <laughs> um, I give a lot of credit to my advanced chemistry teacher from high school because he was willing to go a little bit outside the bounds of his normal curriculum and allow me to pursue an independent study project that I was really captivated by. I'd certainly done all the work that I was supposed to in chemistry class, and I enjoyed it well enough, but the reason that I was enjoying my classwork was more based on the fact that I knew I was supposed to like math and science, and I guess I had enough of a self-image around me liking math and science that um, it was self-fulfilling enough to get me by, and I worked hard at it. Um, but I didn't have that real, for lack of a better word, spark, I guess, um, until this particular class project, which was one of the earlier ones that I got to experience, where I was actually completely self-motivated to carry this out. I was excited about it. I had a real reason that I cared about to learn my coursework, and I couldn't wait to actually apply it in the classroom, or in this case, at home, because 
Well, it didn't seem like a great idea to uh, try to make rocket fuel at school. My parents, in the same manner that they allowed me to use a hammer and nails when I was three and a half, they allowed me to try to mix up my own mixture of rocket fuel in the kitchen at home. <coughs> now, just a general description of the process. In October Sky, it's the story of the Rocket Boys and uh, Homer Hickam and his friends in West Virginia growing up in coal mining country, they also became captivated by rockets and would basically stop at nothing to learn about rockets, build their own rockets at any cost. And they were successful. It's a wonderful story of success in engineering that's founded in that why, that personal fulfillment. And it's founded in that personal fulfillment in the same way that I feel it, where I feel a tremendous amount of personal fulfillment from these activities, but more importantly, that fulfillment and that enjoyment is what's driving my study in the first place. It's, a, it's an important feedback loop for me that I also try to instill in other kids. So off we go with this little rocket fuel experiment. Now the Rocket Boys made a couple of different mixtures of rocket fuel. One was called rocket candy. You take uh, potassium nitrate or saltpeter, sugar and sulfur, and you need to melt them together over low heat. Now an important part of rocket fuel and why it's different from explosives is that it burns nice and slowly compared to an explosive. It burns at a controlled rate. The whole purpose of the rocket is that it's exhausting its chemical energy as it goes upward. It's not exhausting all of its chemistry or chemical energy at the same time, which would be an explosion. So the goal is to bind these ingredients together so they don't explode. If you just leave it as a powder, <coughs> you're in trouble if you light that stuff up. So we find ourselves in the kitchen at home with my wonderfully generous parents. Uh, making sure we had our safety glasses on and our gloves on. And my dad made sure that I had the fire extinguisher out and prepped. And of course, I'm thinking, oh, dad, what's going to go wrong? Like, we really need a fire extinguisher out on the kitchen table for this? Okay. Boy. So the process involves binding the mixture together. What you do is melt it over very low heat, and eventually the mixture sort of caramelizes. That's why they called it rocket candy. Um, when the sugar melts into the rest of the mixture, it smells just like you're making caramel. Um, so you kind of mix it slowly and eventually it gets up to the right temperature and the, and the powdery mixture kind of glassifies and then it turns into a liquid and you have this like really runny caramel mixture that you pour into the rocket engine. And we were using the little cardboard ones that were spent engines from our Estes rockets. The idea was to pour the rocket candy into there and then put it onto our own rocket uh, power testing apparatus which consisted of a, uh, a record player going around at 33 and a third RPM and a marker that was spring-loaded so that as the, as the record player rotated, the thrust of the rocket would push down against the spring, making a mark that traveled along the circular path that was being traced by the record player. So it would basically give us a thrust map over time of that rocket engine. So it seemed like a great idea. There we are, melting along. Things are going pretty okay. We've got a couple rocket engines filled. And I'm doing this in a tuna fish can, because at least I had the forethought not to ruin my mom's pots and pans by putting a melted mixture of rocket fuel into them all. So we've got this tuna fish can, and I'm mixing along, and you mix a little bit, and we're, it's over an electric range, so it felt a little safer than having flames leaping up all the time. And my friend's house, which had a gas range, that was the other alternative. The low heat's going fine. Every once in a while, like a little piece drops over the edge. It doesn't seem like a big deal because it's such a small, tiny piece. We've got the big bulk of it safely contained within the tuna fish can. And it just makes a little pop or a fizzle when it hits the range. It's not any big deal. At least it didn't feel like to us. Uh, you know, it's, it's smaller than a match head. Just pop, pop, fizzle, melt, 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 pour, getting ready. Can't wait to test it out. Well, we've, in trying to keep the hot things separated from the more explosive things, we've got the, the pre-mixed should have thought that one through. Set of dry powder, all ready to go, safely contained about four feet away. Well, over here, we're mixing away. Do, 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 do. A little piece falls over, not a big deal. A little bigger piece fell over. Didn't seem like a big deal either. But then those moments happen in life when stuff is so dire, your perception just zeroes in and you start perceiving life in slow motion. This bigger piece falls over and goes pop flies upward, sizzling, <laughs> over toward the dry rocket fuel. <laughs> and it's that situation where you, you, you understand what's about to happen, <laughs> and there is nothing you can do to stop it. We watch this little piece go over 
into the bowl of dry rocket fuel, which we were binding together in the first place so it wouldn't explode, it catches on fire. Now we've got a bowl, there's a cereal bowl full of several cups of this stuff, of a rapidly burning, now self-propelling mixture <laughs> that doesn't only burn, it's flying through the air and sticking to things. <laughs> and then burning. I'm watching this happen in slow motion thinking, is this when I'm supposed to use the fire extinguisher? <laughs> it was such a shocking moment to find myself at that spot. So I pull the pen and I start blasting all over the place. Now the house is filling up with this dry chemical mixture. It's slightly caustic. It's like baking soda, but it's got a couple more extra chemicals in it. And the house is now billowing not only with a huge amount of dry chem powder, which is coating everything, but a huge amount of smoke as well coming from the fire, uh, from, the fire from the rocket fuel. Fortunately, my, my friend, that was my lab partner at the time, had the presence of mind to shut the door to the piano studio, which was adjacent to the kitchen, so at least the piano's not getting coated in all the smoke. I'm blasting away with the, the dry chem fire extinguisher. But what's the, what's the important part about rocket fuel that makes it able to burn all by itself, even in the absence of oxygen? It has its own oxidizers. The whole point is that it can burn and create these intense exhaust gases from within the rocket engine. You're not having to suck oxygen through like you are a jet engine to make it burn. So despite the fact that I'm blasting dry chem fire extinguisher powder all over the place, it's not stopping the rocket fuel from burning. I literally had to wait for it to burn out. Fortunately, the, uh, the fire extinguisher helped prevent more of the kitchen from catching on fire. But by the time we were done, we had destroyed the range. Most of the linoleum floors were gone. The uh, cabinets on the side and to the front of the range, which had also caught a fair bit of sticky burning rocket fuel, were also destroyed. And we were sitting there, hands on our heads, wondering what to do next. Now, there are two funny culminations to this story. One is that I grew up two doors down from the fire chief. <laughs> this wasn't the first time I had made something that had some amount of destructive power. I built a lot of potato guns and sort of things, sorts of things before, so <clears throat> With kind of a wry smile, he has seen the smoke billowing out of the house. He just calmly walks down his stairs, turns on the lights to his fire car in his driveway, walks up the driveway like he's been expecting this for years. <laughs> 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 Sees me and my lab partner, Victor, come out of the house and asks, is it out? We said, yeah. He said, okay. And the fire department still came to help make sure everything was out, but he just kind of shook his head. My parents, this is where I, I really owe them the most gratitude and credit. <laughs> they let me hammer my thumbs and they let me destroy the kitchen. My parents didn't so much as raise a voice. They didn't act angry at all. I'm sure they were disappointed. There's a little bit of fear that anybody had gotten hurt. Once that was all established to be okay, the big statement my parents said was, um, well, we were thinking of remodeling the kitchen or the bathroom. <laughs> I guess it's gonna be the kitchen. <laughs> I was responsible for a lot of the elbow grease that went into that remodel project. But to this day, I, I owe them the, I owe them a lot of credit and gratitude for uh, not stopping the whole thing right there and saying that I should just practice piano and try to become a musician because engineering was gonna be a bad idea. Um, that wasn't the only project I built, like I said. As I grew up, um, not only was I blessed to have parents with a very high tolerance for the risks that their uh, enterprising young son wanted to undertake, uh, they also had a fair bit of foresight in that, uh, well, I guess I kind of made it obvious. I just couldn't stop building stuff when I was a kid. I, from about age 18 months when I would just dig in the garden constantly making piles of dirt and holes in the dirt and, and then eventually running the hose to make a river that I could dam, which eventually washed all of the topsoil down the street. Again, they didn't complain. Um, it was clear that I really wanted to just be making stuff all the time, so they would take me on a lot of trips to the hardware store and I spent every weekend looking forward to when I would get to go to the hardware store and buy the next set of supplies for my projects, whether it be um, a three-wheeled land sailor whose design I was copying. I'd seen one in a magazine and wanted to try it out. We lived at the beach in Oregon, so 
big, wide, expansive beaches with a fair bit of wind. It was a great place to try out a land sailor. In about sixth grade, I had seen a picture of one in a magazine and thought, I want to build that. So that was my whole summer project, building my own land sailor. I ran into a number of exciting extra challenges I never would have anticipated. I built the first land sailor and uh, got to try it out down the driveway, back up the driveway. It worked really well. I could actually sail around the street. I realized I couldn't fit it into the back of the car to get it to the beach, which warranted an entirely new design revision based on sawing off the the ends of the wide base uh, that prevented the thing from tipping over and figuring out how to make a folding mechanism that fold up, go into the car, and then re-expand out for use at the beach. Um, the potato guns were fun. I picked up a few designs on the internet. I, I did want to stay largely away from the um, kind that uses hairspray and flames, so instead I focused my efforts on doing pneumatic designs, which were based on pumping up a bunch of air into the tank and, uh, and then releasing the air through some kind of valve system, which launches the potato with great success. Um, amusingly, you can store up quite a bit more energy uh, by pumping up a large tank to around 100 PSI than you, know, than you can often release with a normal dose of hairspray. So the, the result of this was, with my own valve designs, I wound up being able to shoot potatoes through three-quarter inch plywood. Uh, which was awesome. <laughs> and man, did I want to keep doing it, because it was fun and challenging, and it gave me a reason to keep iterating on these designs. I also had to make them really good, because every shot had to count. I did not own an air compressor, so every single shot that I pumped up was me with a bike pump. So I wanted them to be good. Now, there was one project that um, set the stage for the larger engineering projects that I wound up tackling through college and then also through my own engineering company. And it's a little more exemplary of the, of the variety of uh, projects that I think we would enjoy for people to be more comfortable solving. And that's, that's the type of project when um, you start it off and you know you want to do it, but you have no idea how to get it done. It's too complicated, it's too multifaceted, there's too many steps in between, you just don't have the base knowledge to even know where to start. That was me in eighth grade when I discovered the magic of Tesla coils. Do you know what a Tesla coil is? Most people are nodding their heads. Uh, invented by Nikola Tesla, it's the basis for the modern radio transmitter. Uh, what captivated me was just what they do. You plug it into a wall outlet or maybe 240, it's a resonant transformer, and up at the top terminal, you get out hundreds of thousands, millions of volts, and it shoots lightning bolts off the top. How cool of a project was that to build? I really wanted to make one. In eighth grade, my understanding of uh, electricity and magnetism was pretty much zero. I had plugged in nine volt batteries to uh, motors that I bought at Radio Shack and would turn those on at school. and um, That was pretty fun, but that was really the extent of my understanding. So when I decided that I wanted to build a Tesla coil, I realized that I had my work cut out for me. I did not realize how much work I had cut out for me if I wanted to get this thing to work. So this picture on the left is me as a sophomore in high school. I worked for three years before there was any resemblance of a functioning Tesla coil uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, in eighth grade, I, the best I could do was buy a book that I found online. It was self-published uh, by a fellow who had built a couple of his own Tesla coils. And it wasn't the best book in the world. It wasn't textbook level by any means. It was made by an amateur, but it had enough in there that I could kind of learn what to do, and I certainly was able to copy the designs roughly that I was seeing and try to learn as I went along. I just wanted it to work so bad. I, I almost can't believe that I worked for three years with basically no success on it, but this is the first time that um, you could say that it was working, and by working, I mean with the lights off, totally dark, and with a very carefully sharpened grounded rod right next to the terminal up at the top. This is basically making it as easy as possible for a spark to jump from the terminal to the grounded rod. With the lights off, I turned it on, I could just see the faintest bit of purple high voltage corona starting to ionize the air. And after that much work, even that small dose of success was, oh, it was huge. I just did not want to stop. It was so exciting to me. And man, did that keep me going. So the project grew and grew, and I eventually wound up um, owning my own 5 kVA distribution transformer, which we wired in our own breaker into the wall in the garage with so that I could run off 240. Um, I got better at building my own capacitors. Uh, I actually had some real understanding of electricity and magnetism, how to build a tank circuit, a resonant tank circuit that would do what I wanted. And by the time I was done, 
uh, it actually worked. Man, it worked, and it was fun. And I, I finally felt the success that I wanted to feel. I had worked at this for so long, and my friends had been hearing about this Tesla coil project for so long and doing a fair bit of teasing me. Oh, I'm working on your Tesla coil at home, huh, Nate, over the weekend? I wanted to show them what I had actually been working on, so I, for lack of a better idea of what to do, I brought it to the high school talent show my senior year. <laughs> <laughs> kind of with the eye, like, this is it, this is what I've been making. Um, people did not know what to think of it. I mean, it, they were impressed, I think. I, you know, I blasted the foil off of a whole bunch of CDs with a long arc of, of electricity, and um, I think people were still just far too baffled to really understand why, why I had done this, although they did think it was cool. Here's a picture of it working. Uh, so you can see it down at the bottom. I had, I had advanced to a uh, synchronous rotary spark gap, which was discharging the capacitors exactly when they were full every time into the primary coil. Um, the discharge is probably around six or 700,000 volts. Um, and a fun part of this whole thing is that the electric field that it creates is so strong and so disruptive, you can hold a fluorescent light bulb in your hand and it'll light up. The electrons are zipping all over through the air and they are successfully ionizing the, the um, molecules inside the light bulbs, so you can kind of wave this lightsaber around. It's also so disruptive in the electromagnetic magnetic regimes that it screws up AM radio nearby and the neighbors can't watch TV. <laughs> Very funny. It would have been almost like cooler and more successful were there watching TV like really loud to be a problem, you know, I'd have this awesome solution. Really, it just kind of fuzzed up their TV and they felt confused and frustrated, but it felt like an accomplishment to, you know, affect something that far away with something that I had made. Um, but another important uh, credit where credit's due to my parents is that uh, I almost killed myself building the Tesla coil. Um, through my, uh, well, there's a, there's a graph I want to show you. This is, uh, <laughs> this is not based on data, but it's very illustrative. <laughs> Now for most, you know, it's obviously true for physical capability, but man, for engineering capability, dangerous combination. Obviously over here is the teenager zone. <laughs> and uh, that was me, uh, both when I was doing the rocket fuel experiment and when I was too excited to work on the Tesla coil to go all the way to the garage to pick up a insulated wire. Instead, I had a bare wire that was right next to me, and I really wanted to turn it back on. I had just made some adjustments and wanted to test it out. Well, I wired it up, and uh, as I reached over to hit the surge suppressor that I was using as an on-off switch that went into the, tra the main transformer, I touched the grounded casing of that surge suppressor as my right hand brushed against the bare copper wire that was attached to the capacitor bank, and I took a 15,000 volt shock from one finger straight across the chest to the other finger. And even worse, I was home alone when I did it on my 16th birthday, which was actually directly against the house rules for my working on the Tesla coil. Um, my parents were great about being understanding and supporting these projects, but they also had you know, a solid set of rules based on my safety and their safety. So you know, I just couldn't hold back. I wanted to do it. I shocked myself. It was basically you know, close to a 50-50 chance that my heart would have gone into fibrillation. It didn't happen feel very fortunate for that, and uh, it set a different tone for my risk assessment mindset <laughs> <laughs> moving ahead. But the funny part about all these projects was um, I did not know that what I was doing was related to engineering, and I had no idea that I could pursue it as a career. I just wanted to make stuff. But how different might it have been had I known that MacGyver was definitely an engineer. They never say that. My, my, my beef with um, Hollywood is that the smartest person they know about is a physicist. And don't get me wrong, we, we need physicists, and it's wonderful to have inspiring figures in physics, but they're not awesome because they're performing physics experiments. They're doing engineering. But how many people that aren't an engineer would correctly identify MacGyver as an engineer? Not very many people. Same thing with Q. Even the new Q, he's a software engineer. That's cool. Kind of a new spin on things, but people are not going to identify Q as an engineer. That 
is not a physicist. That's an engineer testing out a prototype. And yet, they call him a physicist, they call his arch nemesis a, phys a physicist, and Iron Man 2, the Russian guy. Oh, it really gets me. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, I'm not sure what it is exactly that Bruce Wayne calls himself, um, but certainly, Lucius Fox, I believe he deserves credit as an engineer. Now, he's later in his career, uh, he's an executive now, but he clearly has the technical competence to know what's going on and be driving the division of applied sciences. They can't even say engineering in the movie. It's applied sciences at Wayne Enterprises. For goodness sakes. How different would it be if all the kids that were getting inspired by the incredible feats of technological and ingenious prowess these people are performing on screen, if they understood that that's engineering? We put a very different tint on what we find inspiring about these characters. Now, from the seemingly random but nevertheless exciting evolution of my career, I find myself in a position where I do get to more directly bridge this particular gap than I ever would have imagined. And uh, to illustrate how and why, I have a little video clip. Trust me. He's caped. Cowed in the coolest superhero of them all. Because underneath that bat suit, Batman only has his human strength and intellect to rely on. That in the greatest arsenal of crime fighting weaponry ever devised. Perhaps we should read the instructions first. But just where does comic book science fiction end and scientific fact begin? All of the tools have some credible basis in scientific reality. What technologies are behind the gadgets in Batman's utility belt? And just how plausible is the Batmobile? These machines now, they do really work. Get ready for a real-life trip to the Batcave. As we reveal the secrets behind Batman tech. Why bats lost the way? That's frightened me. This time my enemies shared my dread. But the most famous use of the Batarang in the comics is as a grappling tool. A device that has now evolved into a grappling gun. And like many others, this technology is anchored solidly in science. To have the grappling hook reach the top of the building, this is relatively easy. You're not looking at, I think, anything more powerful than some very simple spring-loaded guns, air guns, compressor things that you could easily imagine in the size of the handgun. Batman's grappling system also packs enough power to lift the Dark Knight off the ground and into the air in mere seconds. That much liftoff would take a powerful motorized mechanism, one that factors in both Batman's weight and speed of travel. If you look in the movie and estimate the speeds he's going up, you're looking at a power that's around 5,000 watts. To put that in perspective, typical light bulbs are 60 or 100 watts, so you're talking you know, maybe 50 times the power in a standard light bulb. That might sound like a lot, but it's not too bad. You can actually generate that power, and in fact, people have made devices that can pull people up. One of those devices is the Atlas-powered rope ascender used by the U.S. Army. The Atlas is really similar in a lot of ways to what Batman's using right out of the comic book or the movies. Uh, the system is designed to pull a very large load up a rope extremely quickly. Uh, it's great for rapid escape, search and rescue, all sorts of things that Batman's actually doing. The Atlas also lets its user do a controlled descent down the side of a building or a mountain. And its mechanism is relatively simple. It's a lot like a capstan winch on a sailboat. And the capstan basically gives you a very strong circumferential grip around something round when you apply a load to the rope. To engage the rope, you simply wrap it around that capstan winch mechanism in the device, close the lid, and pull the trigger. To operate it, it's like a, a portable drill, variable speed trigger. You pull the trigger more, you're going to go up faster. 
Built for combat search and rescue and other vertical tactical operations, the Atlas can swiftly lift over 500 pounds. So just like Batman's grappling system, carrying two people isn't a problem. A fully loaded soldier is always going to weigh at least about 300 pounds. In the infantry, the lightest pack load that men have is about 75 pounds. From there on, it only gets heavier. So we want to be able to accommodate a soldier and a fully loaded pack at all times. Additionally, if you need to use this device for rescue, it makes it so that you can clip yourself and an additional person in and lift them both at the same time. We built more like a truck that's for vertical operations. So this system's rugged, it can be used a lot, it's got very long battery life uh, and can lift a very high load repeatedly. So this is more of a utilitarian system than what Batman actually has. Today, thanks to scientists and engineers who've been inspired by the gadgets in the Dark Knight's world, Batman's technology is no longer just fantasy. I think much of the technology that comes out of Batman comes out of people who were fans, who are now scientists, inventors, designers. If you're a kid watching this stuff or reading about it, it makes you want to go out there and try to make things yourself. From high-speed Batmobiles to fast-flying Batarang blades, and from armor-plated Batsuits to supercharged grappling guns, Batman has set the standard for superhero tech. Thank you. It felt really good and very cool to get to be involved with that project. Uh, particularly to get in that last line where, you know, this is what we care about, is making the actual connection uh, to why you would really want to do this. Because you care about it, because it's awesome. Now that's what's driven our company um, the whole time since its founding. I got to give a, uh, a cool jobs talk um, a while ago, which was pretty fun. I, you know, you can get lost in the day to day of just about anything, no matter how exciting it might be. And that's certainly true uh, of my job. And I, I, I try very hard to stay present with how much fun I get to have. I actually call work fun club. Sometimes it's ironic uh, when the, the hours are more like 20 hours a day. Um, but I get to work with friends building equipment that we all care about for people that appreciate what we're doing and we're getting to push the, the boundaries of what's possible to accomplish, not just with our equipment, but with the tactics and techniques and procedures uh, which they actually employ our equipment in. When we were um, in college at MIT, we came across one of many design competitions, but this one had a couple of interesting tweaks to it, um, rather than just be about building a, a business plan and presenting that. Uh, this one is sponsored by the uh, Institute for Soldier Nanotechnologies at MIT, which is a research institute whose sole purpose is to increase soldier survivability in the field and decrease soldiers' load using nanotechnology. Now, the fact of the matter is, if you were to go through and tour a nanotechnology lab, it really looks a lot more like a chemistry lab. And while the advances they're making are very significant, they can also feel a little bit intangible. So the ISN chose to start sponsoring a hands-on competition that actually pitted MIT students and engineering students against West Point cadets. And the goal was to build real prototypes of equipment that would be beneficial to people in the field. And the interface with the customer is a very interesting and strengthening part of this whole competition. They actually solicit ideas from the field, uh, from members of the army that are out there, saying, hey, what could you use that would make your job better? In 2004, um, we were still very heavily involved in Afghanistan, and a lot of what was happening was people coming across caves and wells that needed exploration. Now, before every squad had a robot available, and even when they did, but it was inaccessible to a robot, they need to get some kind of eyes and ears down there to figure out what's going on. Now the best option before the Atlas was available was literally draw straws. If you've got the short straw in your squad, you're on the sharp end of the rope as they call it. You get lowered down hand over hand, or maybe if you're lucky tied to a Humvee and you've got a pistol and a flashlight and you've got to explore the place. And of course if you find a person that doesn't want you there, you want out fast. But if it's only your other guys on the end of the rope, it's up to them to pull you out as fast as they can. And of course, then they can't provide force protection and help you out in other ways. 
So their request was, can we have a device that's actually really similar to what Batman has, but could also let us repel, so that we could repel down into the cave or well on this system, and if it gets dangerous and we need out, we pull the trigger and it yanks us back out. Well, we saw that challenge in this competition, and when combined with just how cool that would be to actually make, with the fact that this particular competition gives you a little bit of money to build the prototype with, we were in. This was the same reason why we jump off buildings and do flips and take pictures of it. It's the same reason why I wanted to build the Tesla coil. All of us got together and agreed, this is awesome, and we want to do it. So we set to work, and it was not an easy road by any means. Um, this is very much one of those projects where you know, the end goal is roughly clear, but you're starting with nothing and with everything. And not knowing where to go can be just as challenging when you don't know what, to take, you don't know what the next step is to take. It can also be so challenging um, when there's a million different steps that you could take, any of which could lead you ahead to a successful solution and you just don't know where to go. We worked for, this was faster than my Tesla code development, we worked for four months, developed a prototype that seemed like it was gonna be very close to working and we were now about three days away from the competition. Now, an important stipulation of the competition is that the hardware has to function. Really appealing aspect of this competition for us. You know, you can stick a business plan up on a PowerPoint and that's good, but most of those business plans don't get really tested. Well, these things, oh, they had to work. So at least we were smart enough, had the good enough judgment not to, um, not to use it with live weight. So the judge is there, ready to approve our entry into the final competition. And we had been testing with some lighter loads. We now needed to go up to a heavier load to show we could lift a person before we put a real person on it. Well, we've got a pulley going up over a, over a beam and then it's hooked up to a whole bunch of water bottles. And this is before we could afford a speed control. Now, the requirements for the project were that it could lift a 250 pound load um, at about 10 feet per second, around five times on one battery charge up 50 feet. So you've got a combination of power output requirements and energy storage requirements that are quite challenging to accomplish. Um, like the physicist mentioned in the video, we're looking at power outputs of thousands of watts. That's mechanical power output, not just electrical power output coming out of the battery. So we've got our work cut out for us. And of course, they also want it to be as lightweight as possible. Those poor soldiers are already carrying enough equipment. So we've got this thing together and we're really hoping it's gonna work. But we had to spend all of our money on batteries and a motor. We couldn't afford a speed control that can handle the electrical power that's going through it. So one of the hilarious disadvantages and also exciting features, if, depending on how you wanted to brand it, of this unit was that when you pulled the trigger, it was going full speed right away. <laughs> of course, that also means the whole system is getting shock loaded every time you spin it up. And we built our own gearbox. So there we are, ready to pull the trigger, to pull these water bottles up off the ground to show we can lift a, a person's weight. You know, everybody, you gotta do a countdown anytime you're doing something exciting. A, for safety, so people know when it's gonna happen, and B, because it makes it a lot more exciting. So we count down, pull the trigger, zoom, the slack gets pulled out of the rope, the tension yanks up and the whole system goes tight, the weights jerk off the ground, and as the inertia of the gearbox, it's getting spun up by this tremendously high torque motor, crashes into that final tension when the load hits, the gearbox explodes <laughs> and drops the weights right back down on the ground. <laughs> We're sitting here again with our head in our hands, wondering what to do with only three days left in the competition before we have to show up on stage. Well, the judge was kind enough to say, all right, you know, it didn't work, but clearly you guys have done a lot of work. It would be nice to show what you did in the, you know, in the presentations. Um, why don't you go ahead and see if you can still get it to work and let us know on the day of if you manage to do it. That was the first time I had stayed up two nights in a row machining, trying to get a new prototype to work. Uh, we did it. We managed to change the mechanism, we built, rebuilt the gearbox, still didn't add a speed control. But on the day of the competition, instead of the countdown being toward that moment of pulling the trigger and yanking water off the ground, now the countdown was me ready to see if I was gonna lift off. And lift off, I did, with a jerk. <laughs> Just about jerk my hips out of the pelvis. But then all of a sudden, it was this completely different sensation of the world, where it's just you moving upward really fast. It was exhilarating. And 
really fun and scary and gratifying all at the same time. Talk about personal fulfillment. Like, <laughs> we live for this. This is why we do this. And as we exited the competition, we also noticed not only was this really cool and fun, but we had an actual customer that was asking for it. And it was actually potentially going to be really useful. But we didn't know what to do next. Now, fortunately for us, there were people there to hold our hands. And um, we had to be you know, quite entrepreneurially minded to get ourselves through this open-ended development to a place where we could be having a functioning prototype at the very least. But it's a whole new set of challenges that we had no idea how to navigate to turn it into a commercializable product that can actually get shipped uh, to people that would use it in the field and be able to depend on it. Um, we founded the company shortly after the competition, not because we knew what to do, but because we had a vague notion that there was something that could be done with this awesome potential. And uh, we wanted to file a patent, and we couldn't assign the patent just to our student group. Uh, we needed an entity to assign it to. So we had the good advice to found a company that we could assign the patent to. So we did that. And the next thing we did was get back to work, because we were still in school. I was a senior in 2005 uh, in that spring when we got this thing to work in the first place. Founded the company, and then went right into grad school. Um, it was the next thing on the list, and it was uh, the company project was still small enough that it certainly didn't warrant dropping out of school for yet. And we had a fairly good future ahead of us as uh, grad students. Most of us were ready to get our master's degrees. And we were in a lab that had a tremendous amount of resources available. Um, I feel really fortunate to have found what felt like a home that was just right for me in school uh, when I encountered my advisor, Ian Hunter. He taught a class called Measurement and Instrumentation. And for some reason in his class, I noticed that uh, the content really stuck with me a lot better than many of my other classes. You know, I, I was certainly working hard and felt motivated to do well in my other classes, but there wasn't a real grounding, this is going to be super useful for me. Was, I, I know I need to learn thermal fluids because it's important for engineers to know, so I did that. But in measurement and instrumentation class, which we also sometimes call discovery channel class because it often included the professor, Professor Hunter, just passing around awesome pieces of technology, which he taught us how to do first order calculations on in a ways that allowed us to employ that technology relatively quickly with very practical hands-on skill set. That was the stuff I wanted to do. All of a sudden, I felt this, this kind of shift in how my education felt, at least particularly in that class, because my knowledge retention was great. I had no problem on the tests and quizzes. I just, I remembered all of the details that were pertinent. And it didn't feel like work anymore either. Like, I, I really wanted to be learning these things. So I kept asking Professor Hunter questions after class. You know, he would often share stories that I identified with, and I wanted to tell him about things that I had developed too. So he said, well, why don't you come and do an undergraduate research project in my lab? And I said, sweet. I said, sweet, even louder when uh, I got the intro to his lab, and he told me about his general philosophy about what his lab was about. Um, his lab is called the Bioinstrumentation Lab, and his philosophy is to take cross-disciplinary experts from many different fields, put them all together in the same lab in a collaborative environment, and then don't hold back on giving them the resources they need to be as creative and productive as they need to be. His exact statement to me was, I do not want for the creative process to be limited for lack of resources. What? <laughs> And I got the keys to that in my own way by being included in his lab. It was perfect. And so it was with lab mates from that lab that we did this project together and founded this company. There were many things about starting a company in grad school at MIT that I came to appreciate. Um, not the least of which was having a graduate stipend that we could still pay the bills with while we worked on our project during the nighttime. So the days looked mostly like during the day, we're doing our grad school studies, doing research assistantships in the lab. Uh, and then at nighttime, we're trying to work on the prototype using the machine tools. And it was fun. But we didn't know where to go next. We got to do a fair number of <coughs> demos with um, people that were coming through the Institute for Solar Nanotechnologies. And over time, um, I would say we sort of accidentally got to know our customers. Uh, we didn't have enough mentorship or guidance at that time to 
know how to actively facilitate a conversation that would let us really understand what our customers needed. So our general song and dance was, hey, we've got this really cool thing. What do you think? And the customers would say, yeah, that's neat. When can we buy one? And we would say, well, no, we need R&D money. And they'd say, so when can we buy one? Well, it took us quite a long time to really understand what their needs were. It wasn't just about them needing it to weigh a certain amount or be able to lift a certain amount. Uh, we had to learn about a oh, program officer in the government has a different set of needs that they have to fulfill than the end user does. So they're our actual customers. So we had to learn about how to run a development program and how to be able to communicate our capability to them in a way that they felt assured we could execute a project that was funded by them. There was a whole set of things that we had to do. And we had some guidance, but more importantly, we had the want to, for lack of a better word. Um, this project was fun, it was challenging. We got consistent feedback from those customers and from the end users that there was real value to be had by developing this into a state where it could be commercialized and, and brought to them in the field. And we also noticed ourselves just wanting to spend a lot more time doing this fun stuff than doing our own research. Well, eventually, we were lucky enough to get uh, a small order uh, from the Army's Rapid Equipping Force. Now, we were still in school. The order came in February of 2007. We were set to graduate in the spring, in June of 2007. We knew our customer well enough to know that their needs included rapid development project, which meant delivery on the order of 90 to 120 days. Um, we promised to do it, and we still had to graduate. <laughs> and we spent four months uh, working around 20 hours a day, except on weekends um, when we would work you know, 18 hours a day, uh, both trying to finish our graduate degrees and get a set of units out the door that would actually survive in the field. We had a wonderful prototype and the proof of technology was there. Um, and it certainly would have fulfilled our contract to supply identical prototypes to what we had built. Um, but we really aspired to more than that and recognized that the needs of the, the end users were a little more expansive than um, just the base set of requirements we had designed to. So we had a tremendous amount of motivation. Um, almost didn't do it again got very close uh, and eventually did. And man, that first set of feedback from those customers when they got to use the systems and tell us about how much easier their jobs were. You know, to perform a rescue, if you're the guy that's stuck on the side of a cliff, um, if you can't get lowered, which is by far easier because gravity is there to help you, you need to get lifted up to get to safety at the top of the cliff. So if you have a rescue squad, it doesn't just include a couple of people to rig up all the ropes. And certainly in a rescue situation, we are not talking about hand over hand just to you at the other end of the rope. There's far too much risk if things let go. So what that means is there's a lot of equipment that needs to get set up to set up all the backups, all of the uh, two to one or three to one pulley systems that allow for a smaller team of people to pull with the required loads. It'll take a solid team of six to eight people a matter of hours to execute a high angle rescue. With our system, it only takes one to two people, a matter of less than an hour, to establish all the rigging needed to perform a safe rescue and to be able to lift the rescuer and the rescuee all the way to the top. It was a dramatic change in what was possible to do. That is some personal fulfillment. <laughs> that really drove us. And the more we got to know our customers and their other sets of varying needs, um, the more we found we were actually in a position to respond to them. We collectively, uh, both from growing up individually in the ways that all of us did, all of us on our team are mechanical engineers that uh, had similar upbringings where we were all making stuff all the time as kids. That kind of background stuck into that particular lab set us up with a, a pretty, functional and practical mindset towards solving these problems um, that served us really well and continues to serve us really well. And it, it feels a little more like MacGyver, I, I guess. I mean, we're not using gum wrappers to short out fuses, but um, a critical part of our success has been maintain, intentionally maintaining the mindset where, on one hand, we are grounded in why we're doing this, because that drives us working hard. There's some higher purpose to it. That's what this all comes down to for me. 
is that beyond, there's something at least one step past what's immediately in front of me. We want to build this prototype because it's going to be awesome. So it's worth me staying up all night to, to get this thing to work. Um, you know, several steps beyond that, we want to get this thing to work because it's going to change how people do their jobs and it's going to change how they're able to save lives. That is a higher purpose that keeps us motivated and keeps us working hard. Um, we became starkly aware of our lack of resources after we had to move out of that lab. We were very safe and comfortable in that nest. We had 24-hour machine access. Um, we had expertise right next door for both business advice um, and for engineering mentorship. Uh, but once we graduated with our master's degrees, we weren't allowed to run our company out of the lab anymore. And the best option that I had was um, asking the landlord if I could move the company into an unused room in the basement. So we wound up there on Beacon Street in a former fraternity building that I had been renting a room in as a grad student. And we have now a 180 square foot office where we're sitting literally elbow to elbow. I like to think of it as sitting within high five distance. But uh, there's a, a clear lack of machine tools here and a lack of many of the resources that most companies would feel like they needed to uh, execute relatively advanced R&D and manufacturing of systems that are going to military users. That's where the entrepreneurially minded uh, -ness really needed to come in. There were just a, a seemingly insurmountable set of challenges to that. And we, rather than focus on the how, it still came back to the why. Our motivation and our self-fulfillment from executing these things is what made us willing to solve these seemingly insurmountable, and not just insurmountable, but undefined set of problems that stand between you and your goals. We've done okay. Um, this is our company picture from this year. We're still small. We have, we're a bootstrap company. We've still not taken on um, any significant outside funding except for a small bridge angel round. And uh, so the growth has been smaller than it might be if we were VC backed. Um, but because that personal fulfillment is such an important part of what motivates us to do what we do, it would feel very different to have a larger overlord, however well-funded, dictating what we do and why. For us, we get to keep it small and personal and very close with the customer, and that matters to us. Um, this is the first time we had ever been able to do this because this was the first time we had this many ascenders all built at the same time <laughs> <laughs> for our largest order ever, which we shipped this year. Um, and uh, I'm proud to say that we have uh, a number of full-time engineers. We're a 10-person company. We get to employ some technicians, which is new for us. We now have people testing all day long, which you'd think you did a lot of testing and things that are important to test, but uh, if you've got every other thing tugging at you and your limited resources in a small company, you only do as much testing as needed. But now, thanks to our full-time test techs, we get to run all kinds of rope, all kinds of loads, all kinds of speeds all day long. Um, that's just one example of some of the, the bigger and more exciting expansions we've had this year. We're also, for the first time, buying our own large machine tools. We have uh, 16,000 pounds of Christmas coming next week, and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> It'll be the first time we had uh, real serious uh, CNC prototyping ability back in our own shop. Today we've had to outsource. And you know, it's, it's been very positive for us and we found some very good partners uh, nearby. Um, but it's just different when you get to take it in your shop and build it yourself. So now that we're in a position where we're trying to employ more engineers that are entrepreneurially minded, entrepreneurs as I, I called it at the very beginning slide, um, I certainly can't help but notice how they're not all just coming out of engineering school with the exact skill set we want. We, we know well that uh, well, one of the things we care about and one of the things that seems to be persistently deficient um, are young engineers' ability to go from point A to point B when what's in the middle is quite undefined outside of the traditional classroom um, you know, test. Uh, things are quite a bit more up in the air then we might, be like to, we might like to be led to believe when we're students. The fact of the matter is that it's you know, 
at least a little more like this. Oh, those blue lines are very thin. Anyway, we know that at least there are multiple ways to get from point A to point B, which makes it a little bit more daunting. Um, you know, you're not sure to take the lower path and try to connect it to the upper path, uh, just as an example. But in my experience in running a small engineering company, however motivated, the chart usually looks something more like this. <laughs> it is a minefield out there. There are so many different ways you could pursue every part of the project that is important to you and important to your customers that you solve that it very seldom actually comes down to just your set of technical problem solving skills. We can't just Tony Stark genius engineer our way out of the situation. You find yourself being in, even if you're not in a startup company in the traditional entrepreneur sense, um, in any set of the problems that matter that we know we are currently encountering and that future engineering students are going to encounter, it is far more undefined than ever before. And the skill set that matters to us is not just the ability to have the technical competence, but all of the other skill sets that go along with being able to use that technical competence in a way that matters. And you have to be able to do risk assessment. You have to be able to discern what's most important to the project in the first place. Are we going to B, or is, is it actually point C that we need to get to? Do we have to go through B to get there? It's far more open-ended than I was ever led to believe, certainly. There are some rough surprises, but some learning opportunities, as I might say. And then there's people involved. Oh man, are there people involved. You know, we, we try to stress um, the importance of teamwork and communication skills with engineering students. And that is absolutely true. And I felt that in my own education, those were adequately stressed. I, I thought that I had a, uh, a fair sense of there being um, a real motivation to get good at communicating, but oh man, I had no idea how important that really was until in our own company, we got big enough projects that we could no longer just stay up all night as a team of four and get it done. Whether it was people in our own company or subcontractors, our success suddenly went from being a, a very tight, comfortable, closed loop that we could just fix by spending all night in the machine shop to a problem that required other people to work on our behalf. And I felt so certain that there was a set of rules that everybody followed in, uh, in the engineering profession where if you were paying a subcontractor to do a development and you paid them, they would do it. <laughs> Wrong! <laughs> And they might do it and they didn't do it the way that you wanted because you didn't communicate your needs well enough or they might not do it at all. You might get in a fight and then who, who loses? Well, they might not get paid, but your project might fail. There's a kind of a funny saying that I appreciated hearing recently and that's that people aren't motivated when they see the light. People are motivated when they feel the heat. Well, it's certainly in, the, in a position where uh, it's our company and every time we have a major project, our entire company's success depends on the success of that project. The stakes are very different. And it's those stakes and us caring deeply about whether or not we're successful that makes this seem even possible or worthwhile attacking. Our profession is very fulfilling. I feel deeply that that is true and I experience it myself and I try very hard to express that to other people that might have open ears to hear it because for heaven's sake I do not want for a potentially talented engineer to miss out on the wonderful profession not only for the lack of their own personal fulfillment but for the to change that we need in the world from them so there's it is fulfilling to do this but more importantly than it just being fulfilling to do this uh, it is that fulfillment that for me and for people at our company, makes that possible. It is what drives our willingness to start hunting down the path, not without fear, but with an understanding that there's not going to be very many ways around this success uh, without just plowing into it. So when people ask if it's a good idea for them to start a company, when younger students ask me, uh, 
like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a company, um, but I thought I might go out and get some experience first. Experience is great, um, but there's no experience like feeling the heat yourself and seeing what things that motivates. Uh, and so my usual encouragement is if, if there's a way that you can feed yourself, start the company. Um, because it's those higher purposes that really motivate what's going on, um, it's a, there's a nice extension to that being why we're all here. Um, we all care about these things very deeply and we're working very hard and I thank you for your own efforts in trying to create the type of engineers that I want to hire, that I want to work with, um, that I also feel that we need uh, to change the world. And so um, thank you very much for having me here and thank you for your hard work and I would be delighted to take some questions. Questions for Nate? Oh, yeah. The back end cool video that ends up with the, the Atlas Lifter uh, available online anywhere? Yes. Um, I believe you can search on YouTube for Batman Tech. It was a special on the History Channel just a couple years ago. Yeah. You obviously have very strong technical capabilities. You also are learning some big business challenges. Yeah. How did you develop that business acumen? Was that something you just kind of learned on your own, or did you have advisors along the way to help you with that? That was a really good question. Thanks for asking. Um, we got a lot of mentorship, and it was huge for us. Uh, in fact, it was instrumental. There are a number of different um, entrepreneurial support systems at MIT. There's, uh, there are networks and clubs. Um, of all sorts, but the one that we found was best suited to our needs is one that's called the Venture Mentoring Service. And it's, it's actually under the provost office at MIT, and their function is to, um, is to mentor MIT startups. You can be an MIT alum of any kind and get free advice from the Venture Mentoring Service. It's a group of um, a bunch of entrepreneurs that have different experience across the board in, in every industry. And even if you've only taken one class at MIT, it qualifies you as an alum and you can make use of the service. And they're, they're quite open about their hopes and it's that, you know, if you do well in your venture, you recognize MIT back and it certainly wouldn't seem to be an inappropriate thing to do if that, if that was the case. Um, and also in exchange for the advice, they ask that you follow their advice. And then what they'll do is if you come to them with a venture, um, they'll put together a team of people that have industry expertise in, in what's important to you. And every time you meet with them, often it's monthly or so, they'll give you homework. Um, and it was that level of on-the-ground support that includes everything from um, just advice about general situations to actual hand-holding, like, here's what you need to do to structure a functional collaboration agreement between your company and another company. So that entire skill set of discerning your own needs so that you can express them. It doesn't matter if you're a great communicator, if you don't know what's important to you, what are you gonna communicate that somebody else can respond in helping you out with? So all of those soft skills um, have come from, they, they got their start for us with the Venture Mentoring Service and then we've tried to make our own learning feedback, feedback loops as we've gone ahead. We're, we're now an eight-year-old company, which is surprising to me. Yeah. What are the questions you ask or the process you use when you are interviewing prospective engineer hirees to determine whether or not they've got the instinct or the skills to play happily in the space that you have up there on the slide? I've never quite felt as glad that somebody asked a question. <laughs> I didn't even think about talking about this in my talk. Um, we have a, I think it's fun, we think it's fun, um, and very informative interview process. We call it, uh, and it's mainly applicable for engineers, uh, we call it the engineering pentathlon. 
Um, it starts with usually an, an informal invite to visit our company on Friday. We often do Beer Friday and we'll kind of relax and drink beer and shoot around ideas that are maybe a little outside of what our usual development track is, but they might be fun. So if we spot somebody that might do well at our company, we'll invite them over for Beer Friday and if they seem like a normal person that might warrant uh, moving ahead with, we'll get a resume and we certainly look at the resume and the portfolio is important to us, but then is the engineering pentathlon. Um, it includes, as you might guess, five events and all of them have to do with skills that are very important to day-to-day -day work at our company. And it's designed not just to give us an idea of what they're gonna be like working for us, but to give them a very clear idea of what it would be like to work in our office atmosphere and understand what would be asked of them from a day-to-day -day basis. So are you guys familiar with McMaster Car? They're a supply company. You can buy everything from them. Um, we start them off by having them find uh, certain items on McMaster Car. And uh, we leave it fairly open-ended in a way that uh, resembles the actual needs that, that we have. For instance, they have to find the strongest quarter 20 bolt that they can find. Because that's the set of information they'll be coming in with. Like, we've got this, we can only fit a quarter 20 bolt in there. What's the strongest one we can get? Is it gonna be strong enough? So we'll have them find a couple of items like that. They've also gotta find the most expensive item they can find and the cheapest one. Um, so can they navigate McMaster Car? We have them CAD something um, using SolidWorks. We'll usually stick some random part on their desk and sit there and watch them CAD it. Um, you can tell a lot about a person's prowess in uh, SolidWorks by just watching how they set things up. And it doesn't take long to assess if they're, if they're okay at it or not. And they'll get a pretty clear, oh, we also leave it slightly open-ended in that we ask them to CAD it to the level of fidelity they think is relevant. And we give them a little bit of guidelines too, but you know, seeing what they make of that information is very interesting and informative. Um, then we send them to the machine shop they have 30 minutes to, and it's a cutoff, there's no penalty for not getting it done in time. We don't want people to rush in the shop, but they have to take a piece of stock and machine a cube and then drill a hole in the cube, um, ideally in the middle. Uh, so we see how far they get along with that and you know, we get to observe how competent they are in the machine shop. Then for the mechanical engineers, we call it EE for MEs. <laughs> we give them a large soldering iron really too large to do anything useful with, except maybe make stained glass. Um, and we ask them to uh, solder a couple of wires together, or worse, solder a small surface mount chip onto, the, uh, onto a board. <laughs> it is a hopeless endeavor. Um, so they enjoy seeing how far they can get. We enjoy watching them fumble. We allow them to, say, switch, at which point they can switch the soldering iron. Now, unbeknownst to them, they're changing their already large soldering iron for one that we call Excalibur in the office. <laughs> 300 watt soldering iron. The chisel tip is a solid inch across. You could never solder any chip with that thing without exploding it. Um, what they don't know and what they find out later is that the quality assurance test is simply tapping the board and seeing if it falls off. So can they solder large things? That's all that we really need from our mechanical engineers as far as EE is concerned. And then perhaps the most important event in the engineering pentathlon, they need to write a haiku about their favorite machine tool. <laughs> it is awesome. There have been some wonderful submissions. My, my favorite, I don't remember the entire haiku, but the first line was enough to make a solid impression. Waterfall of teeth. What was it about? Waterfall of teeth. Can you guess what machine tool it is? Bandsaw. Bandsaw, yeah. <laughs> nice job. Anyway, that was the first thing that was re actually poetic to come out of the, the haiku <laughs> section. But at any rate, you know, we get to try them on for size with, with everything from their functional skills to their wit and their ability to take a joke, which is, you know, it's an important part of our office working atmosphere. There's a tremendous amount of trust that we build in a small company. Um, and they need to be able to make their own contributions and hold their own and, um, and also enjoy our particular style of, of mentorship and, and work effort. We work hard, um, but we do it because we love it. Yeah? Uh, which classes did you not have at MIT that you wish to have? Oh, which classes did I not have at MIT which I wish to have? I would have... Uh, I would have really appreciated more mentorship. Um, 
the venture mentoring service filled that gap eventually when I was uh, in graduate school. And we were fortunate enough to find them. But the set of challenges that I ran into that I felt least equipped to deal with when I was, when we were starting out running our own company as 20 somethings financing builds with our own credit cards and you know, finding ourselves in a position where we're depending on other people, other shops to do work for us, but had no idea how to manage them appropriately. We didn't even have to be managing our own engineers yet. We just needed to understand how to manage, well, anybody that we're depending on to get work done. And the set of skills associated with being successful in that, actually good communication skills, discerning what your own needs are, um, and figuring out how to effectively motivate another person, not just in a way that gets them to do the work, it's, but I would have loved to, to learn earlier, how do you forge a positive functional working relationship uh, with another company, with the people in another company that allows you to be successful? Both of you to be successful, that's the dream. Yeah. Um, Sure. Sorry, I keep looking over here. If there's a question over here, pipe up. It, it gave me goosebumps to hear your story early on. Uh, I had a very similar childhood. And God bless your parents for empowering you. And God bless you, more importantly, for empowering yourself. But for me, there was a chasm. And that chasm actually occurred in undergrad. And, and that's why we're here. Uh, could you describe that, that bridge time between the time when you were so self-inspired and empowered as a child and, and then this when you ran MIT as a, as a graduate student and yeah. really had resource and, and a lot of mentoring and so forth, the, the undergrad section of time. Absolutely. I, um, I almost missed my boat, I would say. I, I'm in exactly where I need to be as a mechanical engineer. I almost was an electrical engineer because I was just coming off of this Tesla coil project when I entered MIT. I was very excited about electricity and magnetism, wanted to build a bigger Tesla coil. <laughs> EE would have been a great way to, to learn the skills to do that. Um, it's interesting that you know, I have such a strong motivation from doing what I get to do be, because for me, my particular interests happen, I, I have found ways to match my particular interests with a skill set that I wanted and needed to acquire. Um, in a way that was most meaningful for me. If I had missed my boat and become an electrical engineer, I'm not convinced that I would be doing what I am today. And certainly not with the, the, the vigor and excitement that I do. So I think the problem of enticing students to become engineers that stay in engineering school with the motivation to actually get functional use out of their classes isn't just a matter of proving to them that Tony Stark is an engineer and not a physicist. It's, that's meaningful to you if you want to be the same type of engineer that Tony Stark is, who's motivated by the same things. And that's very powerful, and they portray it so nicely that it's hard not to get swept up in that. But what if what you really care about is environmental engineering? You know, getting, getting the right exposure to that at the right time <laughs> is just as important as feeling excited in the first place. So, that's on my mind quite a bit more. And you know, what's the way that you not only get somebody excited about engineering and, this, and that skill set in general, but how do you make sure that they're going into the right path of engineering that's going to keep them happy and motivated? Fortunately for me, I took an intro to mechanical engineering class when I was a freshman that, that was offered. And for me, I wouldn't be able to design such a class for every set of, of engineers. Um, but uh, for me, th this was right on. When we, when we went into the class, the first thing we had to do was dismantle a, uh, a disposable camera, diagram all the parts, and then put it back together so it worked. <laughs> it's like, oh, I could, this is part of mechanical? I I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm done with electrical. This is where I need to be. You know, for me, I, I was fortunate in that it was that clear. Um, I didn't uh, wind up quite having time to talk about Design Squad, but. Um, if I may just take a minute, I would like to show you, the, they call it the sizzle reel. It gives a, just a brief overview of our mission on Design Squad. And this is for a younger audience, but the mission is the same in that we're trying to cast as wide a net as possible to introduce the population, kids and adults alike, to the many varieties of careers that engineering can be applicable to. 
It's everything from food to fashion to the environment to certainly mechanical and electrical engineering things. But we're trying to show all the different places where engineering can be applied that you might find matter to you. Because that's the loop that we're really trying to close. Not just engineering is cool, but engineering is a path that will allow me to do what matters to me.